Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Yeah, what Clint has read in the scripture reading, if you had your Bibles um, and you went through the text with him, this has been called what Jesus was doing, basin theology. Um, being willing to put your needs, uh, others' needs, ahead of your own agenda. Jesus described it again in the book of Mark, where he says, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So the question is, is servanthood on your agenda? Is that what you wake up to every morning? Is that the goal that you have set for yourself? Is that the goal that you have sent for your children? Servanthood. Slavery, to think of nothing but others. Or do you always have to be right? Do you always have to be first and best? Do you always have to be the authority on everything? How was it that Moses could say, Oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold. But now, please, as he's talking to God, forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book where you have written. Or how could Paul say, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. And of course, Jesus, our Lord, in Philippians 2 says, did not consider equality with God to be something to grasp, to hang on to, but made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human uh, um, likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. All are willing, were willing to die so that others might live. You know, and, and at some point in our lives, we have all contemplated the thought and the question when usually the term martyrs arises, uh, would we be willing to die for Christ if we're put into that situation or somebody else? But coupled with that question, you've heard it asked before, are we willing to live for Christ? Are we willing to be a nothing? Are we willing to go anywhere and do anything for Jesus? Well, we tend to think that when we give of ourselves for others that they either owe us then or we're afraid that people are going to take advantage of us and think that they can walk all over us. So we get defensive. We might think, well, I have my rights. Well, and that's true. Here's two of them that I have found that we have. One's found in John 1. It says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. So there's one right to be called the children of God that has been given to us. The other one's found in Revelation 22. 
Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and they may enter in through the gates into the city. So the rights that we have are the rights that have been given to us as a gift from Christ. They're not mine in the sense of my heritage. They're mine only in a sense of a gift to me by the death of Jesus. And then the rights seem to be conditional upon my obedience. So when I link this thought and these texts with 1 Corinthians chapter 6, which says, we are not our own. We are bought at a price and that we are God's, his. I come then to the conclusion that whatever rights I may think I'm entitled to, as a Christian, I am willing to lay them down for the salvation of my brethren and to the glory of God. This is basin theology or brokenness. I was studying the um, Sabbath school thoughts on a couple different websites. Different uh, individuals, I'm not really positive who this one was from, might have been a guy by the name of um, Jerry Finneman. He, he said this on the um, Sabbath school thoughts for, for today on Job's. Man, if you, haven't, if you haven't gone through the Sabbath school lesson um, before, the one on Job is promising to be excellent. Um, Melody, just, Melody and Dwayne both did a, an excellent job this morning. And that's, of course, not to belittle the class. You know, I just wasn't in that class. Was it good? Anybody in that class? Was it good? Yeah, yeah? okay. There you go. Any class that we have, two of them you can choose from. Anyways, here's what this comment, this Jerry has mentioned. The things that we have, houses, lands, cars, furniture, and clothes, lose their appeal when we see the glory of the cross of Christ. So do sensual pleasure and love of ease. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when we see the cross, you grasp the reality of life. You sense that nothing is yours by right. If one died for all, then all died. A new purpose for living takes over. If you believe this self-propagating gospel, you just had to live for him who died for you, and it wasn't for fear or hope of reward that moved you. Materialism, sensuality, all self-centered motivations were transcended by this phenomenal new reason for living. You saw you, um, yourself eternally in debt to the Son of God. What you see is yourself crucified instead of Christ. He died in place of you. Had he not died, you would be dead. It follows that your life is not your own and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him. Understanding this, no one can live selfish, uh, selfishly if he believes Christ died in, in place of him. Henceforth, he is crucified with Christ. As Paul says in Galatians 2, in this way, the love of Christ constrains us and living for him becomes a joy. Only the heart that has been to the foot of the cross can feel or understand its need or to sense its guilt, or to admit its faults and failures. That's what this service implies, signifies, means. This is what Jesus has done for you and I. 
If we've not been to the cross, if we've not seen Calvary, we miss this entirely. And we think of ourselves then as deserving. Or maybe you're like me. Maybe we're not willing to be honest with God and surrender completely. There's a poem. I may have read it one here, here once before. It's written by a guy named Wilbur Ree. He says, um, maybe you've heard this, I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of him to make me love a black or a white or an Asian or a Hispanic man or pick beats with a migrant. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I would like to buy $3 worth of God. Not wanting to leave the comfort of our zone, we will package God and our idea of a religious commitment to church, to each other, into packages of convenience. A quick example is uh, a package of conveniences labeled time. I'm glad that my Wilson's brothers and sisters are here this morning because it, you can relate to this. <clears throat> In Michigan, at the Wilson Church, um, and I, I, I say this in, because we lived there for a period of time in Wilson. There was a standing joke that there are three time zones and that the church was actually in the crossroad of the three, of the three time zones. It was in and is in central time by just a couple of miles. But half the members live, um, lived in eastern or could have worked in central or vice versa. So clocks were set for one or the other. Ours, when we lived there, were set, we had two clocks. One set for both. And then we have Adventist time, which is renowned the world around. And uh, that basically describes church starts whenever you get there. And we know this by first hand as well. My wife and I, we lived on an island in, uh, in Alaska, and the church rented um, a camp on, on Vank Island, Camp Lorraine. And we would leave the island in the morning. By the time we got to church, it was done. Closing prayer was sung. They were on their way out. Happened lots. As it turned out, you had to take a boat to get there. Then you had to take the car to get to, from from there to the church. But we joke about it, but I wonder if that may be a reason why there isn't more of us of an outcry as to why Jesus hasn't arrived yet. We say tarries, but being late's normal. So why be upset? Don't disturb my time. But the package of pride was the problem that Jesus was dealing with his disciples this day. I'm not the servant to wash the feet. That's not my job description. It belongs to somebody else who's not as good as I am. If you have your Bible still open to chapter 13, verse 3 says, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God. Jesus knew all things. He knew who he was and where he was going and where he had come from. He knew that. But that he might give an example of his own voluntary humility and condescension, he rose from supper. 
which he will not partake of until he returns, laid aside his garments. He laid aside his divinity. He laid aside his understanding of who he was, where he was going, where he came from, and girded himself as a servant. Based in theology, so much is said in that act. If we would behold, as we understand it, all but one there were cleaned, were broken. Each became conscious of the needs of others, especially the spiritual needs. And through their change, broken and selfish lives, they gave themselves to each other. So am I suggesting that we struggle with that here in Lena? Am I suggesting that Lena is a selfish church? Well, in order to wheeze a lot of that question, let me ask a different one. Does anyone here besides me have a problem with pride? Who struggles with letting God do all that he wants to do with us? Anyone here besides me place limits on God? I think the lesson that Jesus was showing to his disciples is clear and it's applicable to us as well. I need to listen more carefully and to respond more fully to what he's trying to tell me. I love Acts just before the Holy Spirit was poured out. They were in the upper room. They had gotten it. They now understood the disciples. They saw it. They were in one accord. That's when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. When they gave themselves fully, wholly to each other and to Christ. That's when it will happen with us as well. I want that to happen. I'm tired of this. The pain. Amen? Not sure how many here have not participated in the communion service in an Adventist church before. If we were to continue on reading John 13, the chapter, we would see that Jesus makes the comment, I have given you an example that you should do um, as I have done to you. So we practice foot washing here in this church. Um, and during our communion service, we do this just prior to the communion service. If you are not a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, <clears throat> we don't practice closed communion. This is open communion, so you are welcome to participate with us. So prior to the emblems, we separate men are, where are the men going to be? Somebody help me. What room? room. I'm sorry, kids' room? Okay, so it'll be down the hall to the right, first door on the right. The women then separate to teen room. teen room, which is all the way down to the hall to the right. Do we have a room for couples? We do. We have a room for couples, husbands and wives. If you feel like you would like to share that, wash each other's feet, um, that would be in the fellowship hall. Um, if you do not wish to partake and eat in that service, you are welcome to stay here and, and wait till the rest of us come back. Um, that's perfectly acceptable, perfectly fine. If you, want to part if you don't want to partake of the foot washing service, but you still want to take partake of the communion service, the emblems, you are welcome to do that as well. 